in the world today. Would you put that in there? church along. Lord, we really appreciate everybody that does everything from the from the, the accounting committee to the Sunday school to everything, Lord, that's done, the attendance taken, everything, Lord. It's a blessing to have folks that want to help the church of the living God in any way. I pray you help us as we look at the scriptures, and Lord, help us as we uh, see uh, uh, what we can see from you. Help us to take home a, a whole uh, a basket full of blessings, Lord. For this week and we thank you for this day in Jesus name we pray amen <laughs>
we've been studying the people that Jesus loved. We've looked at Lazarus. We've looked at Martha. And uh, we got in the middle of talking about Mary. Uh, there's several Marys in the Bible. Um, of course, Jesus' mother's name was Mary. Then you had a lady that got saved out of a, a really bad life, Mary Magdalene. Um, this Mary is neither of those. She's yet another Mary. And uh, this morning we're going to talk about an amazing talent that she had. Turn to uh, John chapter 11. Now, if you can develop this talent, um, did I say John 11? Yeah. That's what you said. That's what I said. And yes, that's what I meant. You'll have to excuse me. My, my cat got very lonely in the middle of the night. <laughs> Came pouncing on me and what a nice long pet session. I don't know. I don't know if she's nervous because a dog moved in next door. She came to see the dog because the dog's chained up in the opposite corner of the yard from mine. But she uh, she hears it barking, and I think it it, it uh, unnerves her, so she comes to get some comfort and protection from uh, you know who. Look at verse uh, 33 through 37. Um, Martha comes and calls Mary and. She comes out and uh, talks to Jesus. She had to walk a little bit where Jesus was because Martha had kind of interrupted his journey. He wasn't quite to Bethany or he was on the outskirts of town or something. But he not, wasn't quite where the graveyard was even. So she had to go and seek him out. Verse 33 says, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, uh, Where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. Most amazing verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? The power that Mary had was she had the ability to move God into action. Now, God does what he wants to. He's, uh, he's God, after all. He can do anything. He can make things. He can destroy things. He can... Uh, you know, cloud up a, a nice bright sunny day and make it storm the rest of the day. He can clear up the storm and make it sunshiny the rest of the day. They don't, he's the one that makes the, uh, the leaves come out on the trees. I love this time of year because a Pensacola goes from dull green to bright green. All the trees got the new little bright green leaves on them everywhere. Uh, to me that's always a good thing. Um, but you know, uh, like every other Christian, uh, I have gotten on my knees in the past, and uh, maybe I had really a, a legitimate need and got down and prayed about it. And you know what? It seems like God just ignored it. He may have heard it, but he didn't answer the prayer. And so, in those kind of times, you wonder, okay, first thing I do is make sure I'm right with God, because um, our sin does hinder. Our yes. relationship with God. Yes, it does. So if you got sin in your life, unconfessed, unrepentant of sin, and you really want an answer to prayer, that's the first thing you ought to do. If you're not getting an answer, is check up on you. Because uh, I mean, who are we to check up on God? But this this little gal, um, now she said the exact same thing that her sister had said. To Jesus, except that I don't believe he said it. She said it in an accusatory way. She merely stated the fact that had Jesus been there, 
the brother would still be alive. And, of course, she missed her brother. Her brother was gone. Um, I got thinking about this this morning, and um, another reason I'm not doing so good, I've, I've had a rough morning, because uh, I got thinking about my daddy. Uh, my daddy's gone. Uh, I would give a lot of money if I could give my daddy another hug. Mm -hmm. Tell my daddy I loved him. Yep. Um, but you know what? I know I'm going to see him again. So I know how this little girl felt. She really didn't she really didn't want to come out of that house. She was mourning her brother. She was willing to let her hyperactive sister, Martha, go chase him down and, you know, do what she was going to Because Martha was the kind of person that, you know, she pretty well had no guard on her mouth and just kind of, you know, <laughs> whatever she was feeling came right out. I'm not, you know, people like that. But Mary was kind of a quiet, reserved person. And she sat there and she did not move till she got the message from her sister that Jesus wanted to talk with her. Well, that was fine with her because of everybody she knew, Jesus could help her out. And I want you to notice that in verse 35, within 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, Jesus was crying too. Because everybody could see how sad this little girl was. So how old was she? I, I don't know, probably in her 20s. Maybe late teens, I don't know. Uh, but she was a she was a, a, a young woman. And her older brother had died. And older brothers kind of traditionally take over, especially when parents have gone, they take over the protection of the other siblings, especially when they're girls. And uh, the siblings go to the elder brother for, you know, uh, advice, protection, uh, sometimes, you know, help with things. Um, and that's, I believe that's right and proper. That's the way it ought to be. Despite what's happening to our country, uh, as that article that I brought to you this morning shows, um, there are a lot of people that still go by the old ways. And they still have a family. They have a mom and a dad and children. And uh, thank God for that. As, as long as that's so, our country's got a hope of uh, coming back from the horrible abyss it's finding itself falling into. Um, turn to uh, 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 14. 2 Chronicles 14. We're going to look at Somebody here. Mary is not the only one in the Bible that had the power to move God. Like I said, I, I don't know. I, I don't think you can go to Bible school and learn how to do this. Matter of fact, the examples that come to mind of times I had trouble getting my prayer answered with God came way after Bible school. Um, this is something you and God have to get together and God has to teach you. 2 Chronicles 14, 11. One more page. It says, And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power, help us, O Lord our God. For we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against the, this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. The next verse says, So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa. Now, here's a historical battle that took place. against the tribes that inhabited Ethiopia and North Africa. They had come for some reason to attack Jerusalem. And 
frankly, Asa was losing. He was losing the battle. He wasn't doing so good. But he loved God and he believed what God said. And he believed in God, God's power. He was afraid, yet he knew where to go. So he went to God. And I want you to notice that at the beginning of verse 11, um, he puts it squarely in God's lap. He tells God that he knows that this big thing that he's asking him is nothing with God. God has the power to do anything you need doing in your life. Um, then you say, well, you know, why doesn't God, you know, when, when my bills need paying, why doesn't God, you know, make a, a, a pile of gold appear on my desk or, uh, you know, in the bank? Well, that's not the way God operates. Um, first of all, God wants you to go out and work for a living. Because in the New Testament, he said that's what you ought to do. You ought to go out and be quiet and make your living. Um, but sometimes something happens that goes beyond your ability making a living to handle it. Um, you realize what a mess people had before they had things like house insurance? Now, I grumble like everybody else. My house insurance comes due and I don't know, you know. Um, I particularly don't want to pay it, but I know that there's a very good reason for paying it. Because I've had the roof torn off my house with a hurricane, and it was pretty nice to have a, a new roof put on my house. Um, you know, I, I was very lucky with that big oak tree that came down in the yard. It messed up my sheds. Uh, it messed up my fences. Um, and uh, when I paid, got the deductible paid, yeah, I took insurance money to help me rebuild those things and put them back. Uh, because, you know, that's a, a large chunk of money to put out the fence in the yard like that. Or to, or to put up, even the cheapest little metal shed like I, I put back in my yard, those things, I, I remember when they used to be $250 or $300. Now they're, now they're like, you know, $1,000 for one of those things. And you still have to put the thing together. <laughs> I'd like to have one of those nice $4,000 wood ones, you know, but because uh, they just bring those on the back of a truck and plunk it down. But, man, that's a lot of money. For me, anyway. Uh, I hate to put this in economic terms, but that's mostly how uh, Americans think of it nowadays. But, you know... Uh, Sometimes all the insurance in the world can't help you. I mean, your child's in the hospital, laying in the hospital bed, and you know they get hooked up like a, uh, you know, a cheap radio set, and and everything's a beeping, and, and you're sitting there in that bed, and you're just praying and praying and praying and praying and praying because you're scared. Amen. There's nothing you can do. The doctors come in and they fiddle around every so often, and you know. Uh, and, and you're glad to see them, but you 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 know the longer it goes that they're not getting better, the more you work. Uh, what you do is you go to God and you say, "Well, I, I, you know, I sit in that uh, chair and I pray and I pray." Well, keep praying, keep praying. There's something that somebody needs to learn somewhere in all this thing. And yeah, sometimes God takes a loved one home to be with Him. But you have to leave that, then you have to deal with another thing. But what, what Mary was dealing with is uh, grief, yes. But you understand, being the, the, the little baby in the family, and she's always mentioned last, and I, I suspect that she was the baby of the family. Her older brother was gone, and, and look, Jesus was walking around on two legs on the earth, and she knew that Jesus couldn't be around all the time. He had stuff to do. Now, we're a lot better because God's with us all the time, the Holy Spirit. 
So, you know, we actually have a, a lot better chance of getting God to do something and to comfort us. But this little girl, with her tears and her humble heart, she moved Jesus to taking care of that for her. That's quite an ability, folks. There's one thing a pastor loves is somebody that's praying for him. Um, you, you, you guys take good care of me. You do. Uh, I've never had to wait to get my paycheck, uh, except under, I don't think I've ever had to wait. Uh, but you know what, if the, uh, uh, let's say a, a brother next car broke down and he just couldn't get over here, or, uh, you know, something awful happened that he was, had to be away, and stuff like that happens, uh, you know, um, things like that happen. You say, what do you do? Well, you just, you pray for that person, and you, you, you go to God and tell God all about it. He knows about it already. But you go with that humble heart and you try to get God to move in your direction and help you and do something. And I've had God do that. I've had, you do, uh, I've had God do amazing things for me. And I've seen God do amazing things for some of you. Um, but that ability to move God, boy, that's, and that's something... You want somebody in your congregation to have that's praying for you, and you want to have it as your pastor. Um, her fear was accompanied with sadness. Um, well, that's a bad combination. You say, why was she sad? Well, she loved her brother. She loved her brother. Um, as you get older, more people that you love go away. Hopefully, God will put some new people in your life to take their place. Um, but you know what? You have to deal with it. You have to go to God and say, God, I'm afraid. I'm sad. Um, please do something to alleviate this situation. Um, and she really didn't go to... Notice she didn't go to God and say, God, raise my brother from the dead. She didn't ask that. Now, Martha, she had a little more gumption. She implied that, you know, Jesus should do something. But Mary kept all that to herself, even in front of the Lord. All she did was just state the fact and, and show Jesus her grief and got him a crying. Uh, that's something when you can get God to share in your emotions. God does care. We, we sing a song called, Does Jesus Care? Jesus cares, folks. Man, he does. He does. When I was 13 and got saved, he cared then. That was in 1973. You realize how long ago that was? That's a long time ago. But I've never had a, a portion of my Christian life where for any significant length of time I doubted God's care and love for me. You say, well, what if God doesn't answer this prayer? It doesn't mean he doesn't love you. That doesn't yeah. mean he's not listening to you. He just got another plan. Aside from the, your idea. You say, well, how can God do that? Well, he made the universe, darling. He can come up with whatever plan he wants to. You say, well... What was she willing to do to get God to move and to act on her behalf? Well, we don't find that in this chapter. We do not. If you look at John 12, just next chapter over, you will see what she was willing to do. Now, we kind of have a weird economy. We use money that is in and of itself worthless. Copper pennies aren't made of copper anymore. They have a little copper in them, but mainly um, they, they, coat it, they coat a coin with that brown stuff to look like copper, um, but it's not. 
Uh, a quarter, a nickel's not made of nickel anymore. A quarter used to be a silver thing. And so did a dollar. A dollar used to be a piece of genuine silver. And then you have a paper money. Well, paper money's put on some cotton rag paper and green and black ink and numbered and basically it's a note saying the government owes you one dollar of real money. How many have ever tried to cash that dollar in for a, a dollar's worth of real money? You can't do it. You go to a bank, they'll laugh you out of the bank. Because you have to deal with whatever currency there is to deal with. In Jesus' day, you didn't have such things as banks. You put your money under the mattress or hid it in a jar up in the attic or, you know, I don't know what people did with it. But here's this woman, and it says in chapter 12, verse number 3, And Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Verse 5, Judas Iscariot is quoted as saying, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? So we think, okay, 300 pence. $3, that's not very much. But you have to understand, money in this day and time was real money. And $3 would just about be a year's salary in that day and time. So here's this little girl. I don't know where she got the money from. Maybe she cashed in the family, uh, you know, uh, goat herd, or I, I don't. Maybe she sold the house. I, I don't know. But she bought this very expensive perfume, this spikenard. You say, why was it so expensive? Because it had to be brought in over the desert and over the seas. And Jerusalem was kind of a uh, middle ground between east and west. A lot of stuff was traded. But some of the stuff was very expensive. You just didn't pop down to the, the local, uh, you know, uh, CVS there in uh, Jerusalem and pick you up a bottle of Spikenard. No, no, no. If you wanted a Spikenard you, and you had money, uh, if there was such a thing in the bank, you'd probably have to go to the bank and get a loan for it. That's how expensive it was. You say, why do you say that? Because this little girl, you know, it's like in, a lot of people, they have a hard time saving their money because they're busy living and spending their money. This is probably all this little girl had. And she was willing to pour it all over Jesus. And some of the disciples said, boy, what a waste. We could, we could use that money for the ministry. Oh, doesn't, doesn't that sound real holy? Mm -hmm. Well, see, Mary, she knew something the others didn't, apparently. She knew that she was, she was helping the Son of God. And her brother had just come back from the dead. She felt like she owed God something. That was God. That was God's working in her heart. Look. It's one thing just to get down on your knees and say, thank you, Lord. It's quite another to, to change your life around in gratitude to what the Lord does. Um, Exodus 35. Let's look at Exodus 35. Um, if you want to study gratitude in the Bible... Really get a picture of it. Study the book of Ruth. I mean, Ruth, man, she, she lost her husband. Uh, she left her homeland. Um, when, when they got back to Israel, uh, her mother-in-law was homeless and helpless and penniless. Mm. Yet, that little girl was one of the most grateful, um, best-hearted people in the whole Bible. So much so, she impressed one of the rich relatives of her dead husband. That's something. 
Boaz didn't have to notice that little girl. Now she was probably pretty, but he had a farm to run. He had, he had a business going on. He didn't have time to go courting some little gal that came out of a country that traditionally was Israel's enemy. But yet, somehow God blessed that little girl. People that God blessed in the Bible, they had good hearts. If you want God to bless you, get a good heart. Keep a good heart. Exodus 35, verse 5. Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it an offering of the Lord gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin dyed red and badger skin and shit of wood and oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense and onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate and every wise hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. I want you to notice that God's work, even in the Old Testament, was built from people that freely gave to the Lord out of their own free will. God doesn't make you give anything that you give. If you give it to the Lord, you say, why do you keep that box? When Brother Bill came here as pastor years ago, we thought about taking that box away. But he said, oh, I'm going to pray about it. After a couple weeks of praying, he said, no, nope, that box is going to stay. That box was put there because the founder of the church did not want people to see what other folks were given. Uh, he knew that it really was none of their business anyway. And he had people with some money in the church and he had some poor people in the church. And so in order to do a service to the poor people and even to the rich people, he, he kept their offerings somewhat incognito. And you know what? I've seen God people come in. I've had missionaries come in and say, what's that? And, and, or, or, you know, we take up an offering and after the service, says, you didn't take a regular Sunday morning offering. And I said, yeah, I did. He said, why did you do that? I don't remember that. And I take them back and I show them the box and explain it to them. And most of them that have a question, their jaw kind of, and they, they, they all say the same thing. Does that work? Yes, it works. Because this church does not depend on somebody saying, hey, look what I give. You do it in secret for the Lord, and the Lord moves upon you, and you put your offering in that box. Amen. And God, God has blessed it and blessed it and blessed it and blessed it and blessed it. Amen. We're building six church buildings in the Philippines, folks. Just because we had so much money in the mission fund, we didn't know what to do with it. Hallelujah. Verse 21, same chapter. Exodus 35. And it says, And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whose spirit made him willing, and brought the, Lord off, the Lord's offering Notice it was the Lord's stuff because they offered it to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his services and for the holy garments. They came, excuse me, and they came both men and women as many as were willing hearted. And we're not going to read the rest of it. But I want you to notice that willing hearted. See, that's what we have here in Mary. Mary had a very willing heart. She had a hungry heart for the Word of God. She didn't go around like a chicken with her head cut off like her sister did, try, trying to make people, and there's nothing wrong with making people comfortable or, or you know, uh, taking care of them when they come into your home to stay or visit or whatever. That's a great thing. But Mary knew what she had in front of her was uh, something that she was not going to see forever. And she wanted to get all of it that she could get and, and it affected her heart. She had a very sweet heart and the Lord knew that. And when he came around finally and saw this little girl weeping 
and, and lost her brother, he just couldn't help it. Because here was someone, he could look into her heart and he could see this, 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 this sweetheart of this little girl, and it broke. Your broken heart can break God's heart. When John Knox said, Give me Scotland or I die, Lord. God gave, God gave him Scotland. He said, Yeah. Because of his heart. Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. <laughs> Two and three. It says how in a great how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power. They were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And this they did, not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. This is high praise from the Apostle Paul. Man. He's saying that the people in Macedonia, the churches there, they knew that the church in Jerusalem was suffering persecution. And people were in hiding instead of out making a living. And in those days, you didn't make a living, you didn't eat. You didn't have clothes to put on your kids. And so out of love for the Lord and out of the love for the Apostle Paul, first of all, they volunteered to go help them. They said, well, put us on a boat. We'll go there and help them. What a blessing. And then they took money they really didn't have from their families and gave it to Paul. And Paul didn't want to take it because he knew it was a great sacrifice for them. And they kind of made him take it. A long time ago, when I was traveling around with Jack Wood going to the prison, uh, I remember all the preachers was uh, sitting on the bed in the afternoon. We... Uh, we, took, we went in the morning and visited cell to cell at the Florida State Prison. Then we, then, we came, uh, then we came back out and had lunch. And then we had the afternoon off. And then we went back for the evening service in the chapel. It was televised to the whole prison. And a lot of times, um, instead of napping, the preachers would sit on the bed. And we, we'd kind of have like a little uh, impromptu round, round table session on some topic. And uh, the topic, the topic today that uh, I remember, I, I remember sitting on the bed. Uh, we were talking about giving to the Lord of yourself, and how much is too much or how much is too little. And uh, <coughs> some of the things that were said were amazing. Um. There's a reason those fellows were wise old men of God. God helped them understand things. Amen. I remember Jack Wood was telling that uh, he learned the hard way that that money that comes into the church really didn't belong to him. It didn't belong to the trustees. That money somehow when it came into the possession of his church, Shady Acres Baptist Church in Houston, Texas, then it became God's things. And it was holy, and it was sanctified, and woe be unto you if you misused it. Amen. And that's the attitude I've had ever since. 
That money in that box is not my money. It's not your money. It's not the trustees' money. It's God's money. And when we sit down and we decide we're going to spend God's money, we have to, we have to be prayerful. Um, someone came this morning and asked me about uh, maybe uh, hiring a, a cleaning service to come in and clean the church periodically. I think that's a good idea. Not because I, I don't think y'all don't clean it well. Y'all do. But everybody in this building are very busy people and it seems like the later we get in this age, the busier people get. And it's hard to keep your own stuff clean, let alone come over and clean the church stuff. So I think it would probably be a, a good thing if we, we did that. <clears throat> We're not going to have them come in every day. I know some of the big churches, they do. They have people that come in every week or every other day and clean the place. Well, this place doesn't get that dirty. Once a month, probably fine. You say, is that a good... Let me tell you why it's a good thing to spend the Lord's money on. Because we want people to come in this church and we want them to sit down in these pews and hear the Word of God. Well, if they sit down and they see mud on the floors or they go to the bathroom and it's all yucky and smelly and gooey, that's not a good testimony, folks. And you'll get them to come back if things are clean. And so I, it, it's, a, it's a good investment to keep this property up. Um, you know, if we ever get a lot more people and some youngins, you know, like in their 20s, that have lots of energy and lots of time, well, you know, maybe we can turn that back over to them. But right now, we don't have that luxury. But we want to keep the church looking nice and everything. So you say, well, why are you going to do that? Because this is the Lord's building. It's the Lord's church. That's the Lord's money. And that money is taken from you and given by you to do the Lord's work. And sometimes the Lord's work takes funny things. I mean, you wouldn't think buying paper for a little shack down in the back of the property. It's God's work. <clears throat> it's doing God's work. We needed a refrigerator. Remember when we didn't have a refrigerator here? <laughs> and, you know, uh, Brother Bill and I prayed about it, and, and he said, we really should have a refrigerator. And that was the justification he used, is because people, they want to come into the church, yeah, you need maybe cold water, or maybe someone wants to bring something for, you know, dinner on the grounds or something. And a refrigerator is a mighty handy thing to have. And you know what? God led us to that little refrigerator and we brought it in. Guess what? It's like it was meant to be there. Yeah. It's amazing what God does. Say so God God was in a refrigerator. God's been all kinds of things. In all kinds of things. It surprises me all the time what, what he does. But it all has to do with people with willing hearts. And you know what? We're never forget that we've got it made in this country. People come from foreign countries and they look at and look, we're not the rich church in town. We're not. We're considered a little podunk place by most of these bigger churches. Mm -hmm. But I've seen missionaries come in here and they're, you know, maybe this is their first couple meetings they've had in the States and they're just eyes get because they, they can't believe well, they got lights and they got a movie screen that comes down from the ceiling and look at them oh they're padded you know and they go to the kitchen and oh they got a microwave in here and you know one of them said well I could live here <laughs> <laughs> yeah you probably could those views are pretty comfortable I've taken a nap on them before so God, he loves people. And these three people, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, just different people as could be. Lazarus, he wouldn't say boo to a bump on a log. He was just a quiet, steady rock of the family. Martha, the tornado. And that was sweet Mary. But you know the one that got the job done? 
It wasn't a tornado. It was a little sweet girl that sat in the sat quietly in the building until she was called for. When God calls you, go. He's got a blessing waiting for you. All right. Well, we've studied these people in the Bible. Um, actually, I, I found I, I found a, a lesson that I didn't know I had. Um, next week we're going to look at two people. Uh, we're going to look at the two thieves on the cross. I don't know what happened in this lesson, why it came loose from the other lessons, but when I was looking through my lesson book, I came across this page, and I noticed that it said lesson 11, and I went back to what I had in my Bible case, and I said, oh, this thing came unstapled. <laughs> so, we're going to study these two thieves. And you say, why in the world should we study these guys? These are archetypes of people you're going to meet every day. You're either going to meet one thief or the other thief. You say, boy, calling people thieves. Well, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for little Mary. Thank you that she could pray and Move, God, you to do things. Thank you, Lord. Help us now as we uh, take a break. And God, this is Easter Sunday, so we're going to talk and sing about you coming up from the grave and the wonderful things you did. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.